What's going on, you beautiful people? My name's Tadai, and I hope you guys had a pretty awesome day today. My day's been pretty awesome so far. So in today's video, what I want to do is show you guys the process I actually went through to create this scene right here. At the start of the video, you saw a uh, pretty quick little uh, intro to the scene and showing off all the different aspects of it. Um, I didn't want to just show off a single image because I felt like there was a lot more to it than just a single image. So I kind of wanted to do something like that, throw something together for you guys there at the start. Hopefully you enjoyed that. So this was a scene that I actually made for a contest for a Ubisoft student contest here in Ontario. It was for the Ubisoft um, Toronto studio. They were having this competition that they have every single year for a couple of years now. It's been going on and I really wanted to enter it. So essentially what was going on was you had to create a scene based off of a story and this story happened to take place involving a Russian World War II submarine that was randomly found in the middle of the desert with a bunch of mysterious objects involved and whatnot and uh, I decided to tackle the inside of the submarine and this is something I had no idea what I was getting myself into when I was uh, creating this at first so I want to break down what I did to create this for those of you who really haven't you know maybe tackled a, a big scene like this head-on before you know break down what it is that you're doing before you start modeling when you're modeling post-production all that kind of stuff just so people have some kind of idea as to what goes into a scene like this and uh, the different steps involved as to how to tackle a giant project like this. So the very first thing that you definitely need to do is research. Now I am not a big military guy by any means. Like I don't know a lot about World War II or, or anything like that. So when it came to the specific submarines and stuff like that, like I do not know what the inside of a World War II Russian submarine looks like. So uh, what I had to do was a bunch of research um, and gather some stuff to go off of first. So I have a little folder here of all of my reference images and whatnot. So uh, the main ones I was going off of was stuff like this. So this is a uh, interior of a World War II Russian submarine. There's a bunch of different ones. Like you get a variety of different stuff. Like this is obviously a bit more uh, of the era in a sense. But uh, as you can see when you're looking at these images, like they are very, very, very complex interiors to this stuff. And one of the most useful things that I found was actually this 3D moving image. And this is what I essentially based most of my scene off of having the two torpedoes here and the beds on top and then the uh, little chambers that you put the torpedoes into and fire them out of. But as you can really sort of gauge just looking at these images here, it is uh, very, very, very complicated. So I do have to do a, a bit of work explaining as to how I got away from this and still made it look somewhat believable. Um, but before I dive into that, I also want to talk about research wasn't just a, a visual thing. I also wanted to research um, the lives of the crew that, uh, that were living in these places just to sort of get an idea for the feel of what things should look like inside of there and get a bit more of a uh, realistic look to it. But uh, after I got my research done, the next important thing was to actually tackle the design of everything. Now, the design was interesting because, like I said, there is no way that someone could really go in and, and model all of these details. Right? Like, there is so much stuff. I could never model every single last bit of this and texture it all and, and do all that within the span of, like, two months or something, whatever the contest time was. It would just be impossible, right? Like, there is so much stuff going on here. So, what I decided to do was, was trying to think of a way around this. Rather than work hard, I wanted to work smart in a sense. So I was thinking, you know, I have played a bunch of games in the past where there were submarine interiors 
And let me go visit those and see what they did for, for that kind of stuff. So what I did was uh, I visited the Modern Warfare Trilogy. You know, think of it what you will. Fantastic games, loved them uh, growing up. And there are a few levels, especially in Modern Warfare 3, where they are, in fact, inside of submarines. And if you go back and play through those levels, you realize that it is very, very simplified. But at no point when playing the game do you ever question the efficiency of the submarine. And that's because in a game environment, most people do not know, like I said earlier, do not know what the inside of this stuff looks like. So as long as you have the general theme and aesthetic and vibe to it, people are going to believe it. Now, I did want to have the, the main elements, of course, but at the same time, I knew I could simplify it quite a bit because people aren't expecting to see, you know, this little gauge here and, and this pipe and, and all this stuff. There's just way too much. All these switches up here, it's just way too much. As long as you get the general gist of it, I think that's good enough. And then I wanted to tell a story with it. I knew that's what I wanted to do. So... When designing this, there was a lot of things that I had to do uh, and keep in mind, but the first thing I wanted to do is get everything to scale. I researched the scale of everything uh, quite a bit. I measured the, the length of the beds, the, the length of the torpedoes, the length of the hull itself, and then I grabbed a 3D character, um, as you can see here. And I imported this guy, just got him off of Google, just Googled uh, 3D character model, free download and something like that. And essentially I then scaled all of the beds, all of the props, pretty much everything to the scale of this guy, assuming he was roughly 2 meters in height. And uh, that's how I got the basic measurements of everything here. And then once I had the basic measurements, what I did was I started to uh, block out my scene. Now before you want to dive into any of your big assets, this is something that is super, super important. You definitely want to block out your scene. Now I'm just going to open up a video. Hopefully it's not playing any music or anything too, too loud here. Um... But as you can see, I just wanted to block out the height of everything. So I knew this is where the bed was going to be going. This is where the torpedoes were also going to be. Um, stuff like where the table is, where the launcher holders are going to be and stuff like that. I just blocked it out. And each one of these blocks is representing roughly one meter in size. As you can see, it's two meters high to represent the, the human. And uh, I just wanted to block everything out as best as I could. And that's because later on, I could just swap up the blocks for assets and know that everything was to scale. So I just blocked out everything roughly without an actual uh, roof or or walls or anything. I just wanted to get the assets blocked out. And uh, that is definitely one of the most important things that you can do. It's definitely block things out before you dive uh, any further into any of this stuff. Just get everything to scale because if things aren't to scale to begin with, it's just going to be completely inaccurate and uh, it's going to go downhill from there. So from there, what I did was I started blocking out... Um, I'm not blocking out, started refining some of my assets. So I wanted to do biggest to smallest. And the reason I wanted to do biggest to smallest was because I knew if I had some of these big shapes in here, like for example, this torpedo, it really isn't that complex of an object, but it takes up a lot of space. So it's going to let me know right away if things are starting to look good, if placement is, is, you know, roughly in the correct area. So what I would do is I would then model my biggest shapes and then sort of work my way into the smaller ones. So I started with the torpedoes and then the holders and then I started working to these big walls here. And uh, the whole time I was doing this, uh, once I started getting these big shapes in, the next thing I wanted to do was get a little gauge for the room here. So I created a different layer for the, the room itself. And this way, when I started getting these smaller objects on here, I could um, have something to attach it to, but I also wanted to make sure I could turn it on and off so I can get inside of here and edit all the little little details and uh, one of the things I noticed before making this video is my Twitter is a pretty good uh, timeline of all the different stuff I was doing here um, so I got the big torpedoes in and the beds like I said just to sort of you know uh, replace some of the blocks with actual assets and as you can see in the background there are still the blocks there so I was just pretty much modeling and then placing it on top and deleting the blocks and if I fast forward a little bit that's when I start getting into the, the smaller details once I know that things are sort of where they should be and uh, I definitely wanted to get these these um, very complex objects to be um, the focal point for sure. This, like I like I said, isn't as complicated as what you guys saw in the reference images, but it's complicated enough to the person who's viewing this, right? Like someone's going to look at that and they're going to say that's complicated. That is obviously how a submarine functions, even though in reality it most certainly is not. Like this is not accurate whatsoever, but nobody's going to have a side-by-side -side comparison. So I thought I could get away with this. Um, and it was also 
at this point that I realized things were very, very symmetrical. Things were looking the exact same on both sides. Same with the uh, torpedoes and all that. And I knew at this point that I was going to have to differentiate this and make it a little bit uh, asymmetrical at one point. But uh, I was just sort of going along and mirroring things over for the most part, keeping it the exact same. Um, then I added the roof here just to sort of get things uh, on top. And then, of course, the UVing. So that's essentially what I did for the, the modeling. I did all the UVing at once because I knew I wanted to do all the texturing at once as well. Um, in a sense, it wasn't exactly like do all the UV and all the texturing, but I, what I would do is I would get the big objects sort of in the in the order that I modeled them, I'd UV and then immediately texture and then uh, bring it into the Unreal Engine, starting with the room itself. And it was very important that I got the room in uh, first before anything else because I knew that I would have to set everything up around this and I wanted the measurements to be the, the, the exact same, of course. So I definitely started with the room and uh, worked my way around that. And then, of course, imported the lights. And the reason I imported the lights is just so that I could actually see. Um, this was not the final lighting by any means. This was, you know, just so I could actually physically see what was going on. The lighting was definitely one of the last things that I wanted to do in the scene. Uh, and then, of course, after the UVing, I started doing some of the, the bigger objects, like I said, uh, starting with uh, the torpedoes, my, working my way to, to some of the objects in the front like this there. And, yep. So I got the, the bed. The torpedoes were textured at this point, but they just weren't actually in the scene. And of course, we're getting more detailed and then the final product there. But of course, there's a lot going on between there. So this is essentially how it looked. Like I said, I started with the biggest and went to the smallest. I did all the texturing actually within Substance Painter. Um, using a bunch of different uh, tools. A lot of them were actually handmade using Crazy Bump, but also a lot of them were just off the Substance Share website where they had some amazing, amazing uh, downloads like like this Dirty Pillow and, and stuff like that. And um, I definitely just, just, you know, borrowed a lot of stuff for this project, that's for sure. So I uh, want to open up the Unreal project itself here just to show off a little bit of what's going on. I'm just going to hit G just to get rid of uh, all those extra stuff. So what I did was then I would, uh, after I imported the the room itself, I started dragging the assets one at a time and uh, further edited the textures within the actual software. So the way that I did that was uh, I imported all my meshes, just right click, import, you know, the, the standard, I drag it in. And then I went to my textures and I made sure that every single texture had a different folder. Uh, this was super important as well, just to keep things clean. So for example, if I open missile and I open up the texture, for the missile, um, there was a little bit of editing did, uh, so I just sort of connected my maps, but as you can see for something like the metallic and the reflectiveness maps, I just sort of adjusted with a multiplier, you know, how intense they were, just because sometimes it is a little bit different and you want to get that exact change when it's affected in the real light, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, what it looks like in substance is, is typically not what it's going to end up looking like in the final product, so you definitely want to be wary of, of tweaking those. And I did do a tutorial on exactly how to do that. Uh, I think it's called importing... Um, Importing textures into the Unreal Engine properly. I'll put a link to that actually in the description for those of you who are curious. But uh, that's how I ended up doing that part. And uh, another thing that I probably should have mentioned earlier was just sort of like how I have this super organized. Organization is super, super key. I also had a very, very organized Maya folder for this. As you can see on the desktop here, um, I had a project file. And I'd highly recommend whenever you're doing a project this big to have a project file. So I have all of my assets in here. Uh, named correctly and then I also have in my images folder folders containing all of my textures and not just the textures but uh, let me find a good one let's see like this pillow not only just the textures but the save file itself just to keep everything all together in one nice convenient location and I found that super super helpful so there was a bunch of different texture styles that I had to, uh, to use when actually plugging in the textures into the scene. So by default, that was the, uh, the missile. That was just sort of the standard way I did textures. Another way that I had to do textures was for objects like this. And um, for this one, I knew I would have to have sort of like this uh, opacity map. Now, if I can just find my little folder for this and open up the texture for this, this one looks a little bit different because we have something called an opacity map. Now, if I delete this, and press save and it's just gonna take a second you're gonna see that this is actually just a planer uh, it's a very very simple shape just a just a standard plane so there's definitely a couple of different textures that I used here I'm just gonna set that back up again just so that it is uh, perfectly fine and back to normal 
So we're gonna hit save on that again and just get that back. But just to show you guys that everything wasn't the exact same, there was a few exceptions like that map. And the other exception was the lights. The lights were actually just a pure white material. Like I have this light and this light as two different objects. And I just had this one set to a white texture and then just cranked up the emissiveness. And essentially those are all the different ways I did the textures. And then the final thing that I wanted to do for the scene was the rendering itself and, and sort of making it look pretty. So though these are giving off uh, a little bit of light, they are by no means the main light source of the scene. So what I wanted to do was put a, if I hit G, directional light shooting out of each of them just to sort of give that idea that it's still giving off light and the light source is coming from there, but uh, there's no way that the emissiveness was gonna was gonna light the whole scene, so that's why I wanted to do that. And then I also added a, um, a couple standard lights just to highlight some of the key areas, such as the front of the hall here. And um, what my professor was telling me when, when we were talking about light in the Unreal Engine it is a lot more important to have many lights that are dim than one light that is very big. So what I wanted to do for this one is have a bunch of very dim lights. Say if I click on any of these lights, like they aren't that powerful, like an intensity of 500, uh, intensity of 400, 250, like that's not a lot by any means. I think when you by default import a light, it is 5,000, yeah, so that is quite a bit. So that's just something to keep in mind there. Have a bunch of lights spread out because even when you're looking in real life, right, like like if you go to any main building, there's a bunch of lights that aren't too bright, and that's just the way the light works, right? Like there's many sources, and none of them are too, too powerful uh, on their own. Other than lighting, I implemented a particle system. Um, I just wanted to make sure that, that you know, it kind of had that old look to it. I implemented some dust uh, that was floating around. I'm sure you saw that at the starting video. And uh, from there, what I wanted to do is just sort of make it seem alive. This was the point where, where there wasn't any paper here. There wasn't um, posters. There wasn't, uh, you know, journals and stuff like that on people's beds. And it was very, very symmetrical other than maybe, um, let's say, this stuff here and this stuff here. So I wanted to add the papers on the ground to show a very chaotic scene. Uh, this was already adding some weird vibes to it. So I thought it already made sense to have something weird going on here. Um, then I continued it over here, just some old photographs as well, and just fire hydrants because uh, in one of the reference images there was a lot of fire hydrants. I didn't exactly know why, but I thought it was a good idea to just fill this up with something, and I thought it actually fit pretty well. Of course, the color scheme was also matching with the fire hydrants pretty well, and uh, essentially that's how I did it. The planning, of course, doing all the research, then sort of... Um, coming up with a with a smart idea as to how I can tackle such a complex uh, scene without doing as much work as as I probably should because you know making something that was photorealistic to to this would probably drive me crazy it, this scene already drive me crazy pretty much because I put so much goddamn time into it that's why I haven't uploaded in so long is because I was just spending so much time on it um, but I wanted to come up with a smart way around that and then from there blocking out the scene in Maya and then modeling, UVing, texturing, and setting up, and then finally rendering it. And uh, essentially, that is how I went about going through this entire process. And it's really, really cool when you can finally walk around your scene and like think to yourself that this is all working in real time. The collision is working on every single thing. Like, I can shoot something that's going to bounce off of it and whatnot. And uh, yeah, so that's essentially the process I went through for this project. Um, if you have any comments or anything that you'd like to ask about this, please let me know. If you'd want any specific tutorials regarding what you've seen in this scene, uh, please let me know as well. I just wanted to do a general breakdown because I was posting a lot of this on Twitter and people were asking questions about it and I just wanted to clarify, you know, my entire process, my entire method. Another thing that I want to say is, is little details do go a long way. For example, like the leather strap and even just the wrinkles in the bed are just some of my favorite things in the scene. And it's things that I don't think people really notice because they're probably looking over here over here or where a lot of the mess is but yeah just the little things like the the bed texture and stuff like that it's like my favorite the pillow and the way that the uh the actual pillow is poking through over the sheet or under the sheet rather like the little things go a long way as well so so implementing those into your design is also a very important thing but essentially this is my scene i just wanted to show it off to you guys and, and explain to you guys how i made it because this is probably the biggest thing i've ever made ever and i'm very very proud of it but of course there's plenty of room for for feedback so if any of you guys have anything that you think would make this scene better please let me know but like i said if you also have questions about how any of this was done i'd love to hear them in the comments down below but anyways guys thank you so much for watching a like on this video it would be very very appreciated but once again my name has been tie-dye 
and I will catch you in the next video. See ya.